So in the uh, first part of this presentation, kind of focused mostly on some uh, uh, basic uh, uh, anatomical descriptions, right? We talked about uh, uh, fractures and sort of how to uh, keep in mind the um, parts of the bone uh, anatomically, right? So this way is proximal. Right, and then uh, away from the center of the body, right, that's distal. Right, and then you have your your uh, your uh, anatomic areas of the bone, right? So this would be the, let's say this is the diaphysis of the tibia, all this area. Um, and then you have the metaphysis, which is probably, the distal metaphysis would be here. Uh, proximal metaphysis, maybe this portion here, and then you have the epiphysis, right, or the uh, portion with the articular surface, right, so the joint surface. So uh, diaphysis, uh, metaphysis, and epiphysis. All right, so keep those in mind. Obviously we're going to use a lot of that terminology. Uh, the joint surface, sometimes we just call it the joint surface rather than the epiphysis or the distal end. And we talked about physical examination, about how you, know, you need to look for tenderness uh, to palpation at the fracture site for questionable cases. You know, you're not always going to have a case that looks like this, for instance. Um, uh, and uh, now we're going to come to imaging, right? So plain radiographs are often sufficient. Right, you need uh, uh, orthogonal views, meaning like an AP and a lateral, for instance, uh, so that you don't miss uh, injuries. Like, for instance, if uh, there's a fracture that looks non-displaced on an AP, it can be completely displaced on a lateral um, because you're two, there's a two-dimensional views, right? Um, when we look at diaphyseal fractures, we typically want to get a joint above and a joint below, right? So uh, the reason for that is, um, you know, if you have a diaphyseal fracture here, uh, a diaphyseal fracture frequently can present with a dislocation at the joint, right? Now in the lower leg we don't see it as much, but in the upper extremity we see it a lot. So we often, you know, tell uh, residents to make sure you, you check, uh, like for a forearm fracture, an elbow and a wrist, okay? So joint above, joint below, especially for the, you know, the diaphyseal fractures, especially in the upper extremities. So CT scans sometimes needed, right? So CT scans are, and I'll get into that, um, looking at certain fractures in a different way, preoperative planning, uh, articular injuries, et cetera. And then MRI and nuclear imaging uh, can be done for occult fractures, maybe a stress fracture, maybe a femoral neck fracture in a patient where you highly you suspect it and you really want to be 100% sure if there's a fracture there, but you can't see it on x-ray. So what about CT scans? Well, CT scans are um, uh, for better assessing uh, articular fractures, right? So uh, the joint surface sometimes, uh, you know, it, you, you can't see certain fracture lines. You really want to know if there's a fracture line because if the joint is disrupted or if there's a fracture through the joint, that affects a moving part, right? Um, so CT scans are helpful for that. Um, they are uh, good for preoperative planning purposes. Okay, so certainly if you think about uh, something like this uh, pelvis over here uh, with this acetabulum fracture, it looks like perhaps the acetabulum uh, fractured through here, perhaps through the posterior wall as well. Not sure if the femoral head is even in the acetabulum. Uh, and with these 3D uh, recons, you can often take this image and you know spin it 360. Uh, and up and down, and you can kind of look and see peak back what's back here, peak what's on the you know, inner part of the pelvis here. And you know, for pelvic, scapular, and spine fractures, they're really helpful, right? Because they're not just simple long bones; uh, they're very, very three-dimensional structures. And uh, CT scanning can, can be helpful for that. And I didn't really show, but in this uh, 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 here, there is actually a SI joint dislocation. Okay, so uh, that's something that may have been missed on a uh, on a uh, plain x-ray. So what about treatment? Well, bone heals itself by regenerating uh, new bone tissue rather than 
uh, scar tissue, right? So um, if you think about when you cut your skin or uh, you tear muscle, it heals with, heals with scar tissue. But bone, it can't heal with scar tissue, right? It needs to be, uh, it needs to provide mechanical support. Uh, so it has to heal with something strong like bone. So it actually is a regenerative uh, healing process where it creates new bone rather than just a scar tissue. Uh, now we can assist it in optimizing multiple factors like fracture alignment, or so-called reduction, uh, articular alignment, length, rotation, uh, the local environment. So, you know, when we decide that we have to manage a fracture, patient comes to us as the doctor, well, what are you going to do? Well, these are the things that you can do to help them um, heal in an optimal uh, manner. So, what are some of these options? Well, they are closed reduction and casting. Here's a nice example of, of a long leg cast for somebody who maybe had a tibia fracture. Um, ORIF, or open reduction internal fixation, uh, perhaps with a, like a plate and screws. Here's an example of a fracture implant plate that you may see in the operating room. Uh, external fixation, something shown here when you have pins coming out of the skin and then bars and clamps holding it in place. Uh, perhaps intramedullary rotting, here's an example of a rod that we may put in somebody's tibia, for instance, uh, inside the bone in the intramedullary canal, or arthroplasty, which is like a joint replacement. So those are just you know some of the broad options that uh, are there, surgical and non-surgical. So casting and bracing are indicated when fracture alignment is acceptable, when immediate joint motion is not necessary, and uh, when surgery is contraindicated. Okay, so it doesn't have to be contraindicated, but if it is contraindicated, then you're left with having to do a cast or a brace for, for many cases. Open reduction internal fixation is indicated when anatomic reduction of the fracture is necessary. So if you need to make something look perfect for whatever reason, I won't get into all of that, but one thing I would say is joint surfaces, for instance, need to be uh, anatomic. So when you have a disruption of the joint surface, we usually have to open it, put it back together. Um, uh, some non-articular fractures, like we see here in this humerus, uh, sometimes are better off treated with open reduction internal fixation. I won't get too much into why some do and some don't, but uh, certainly, like I said, articular fractures do. Um, if you have a fracture where early joint motion is preferable, so come back to this, or even this, um, if you were to treat a, let's say, if it was a non-displaced scaphoid non-surgically, patient would be in a cast for um, potentially three months or so. Whereas if you treat them with fixation, the patient can move their wrist sooner. And you know, for somebody who works, somebody who uses their hands a lot, that may be really beneficial. Um, similarly, humerus fracture. I mean, if uh, I don't know, a surgeon were to break their humerus. They may not uh, want to be in a splint or a cast for months, not able to move the elbow or shoulder, and may prefer to be fixed so that they can actually go on and use their elbow and arm and use move the joints. So sometimes surgery is indicated for, for those reasons. What about external fixation? Well, X-fix or external fixation is indicated when surgical reduction and uh, stabilization is needed, but uh, both casting and internal fixation are contraindicated. Sorry, the picture cut off those uh, last couple of letters there. Um, but uh, this is for severe open fractures, uh, for uh, infections, and these are just some examples. Uh, or perhaps the bony anatomy is not amenable to internal fixation, right? So if you have uh, uh, here you have uh, this uh, nice example of a straight uh, tibia. You could imagine if you wanted to, I mean, if, if, if this patient was definitively going to be treated with a rod, I mean, you could get a rod, you know, commercially available, a rod that dropped down there. Sorry, it's not perfectly straight. But let's just say that that person's uh, uh, tibia was normally, like in, in that particular patient, they had rickets or something, and they have this long sloping bow, and then they fracture here. Well, you know, they don't make rods to go inside someone's tibia and recreate this. You know, and you may not want to recreate that. You may fix this so that they become straight. But, um, or let's just say the patient doesn't have uh, a proper uh, canal, right? So, you know, there's actually, it's hollow, right? So there's a, 
there's like a medullary canal where the rod has to fit. Well, some people that canal is extremely narrowed and um, you can't get a rod to go down. So uh, in those cases, um, again, something like an external fixator is you can put a couple of pins and a bar and just about anything. Uh, and these are two examples. Here's an example of a um, uh, sort of a uniplanar simple fixator. Uh, and here's an, and perhaps there's a, uh, um, yeah, perhaps there's a fracture. Uh, let's just get rid of this. And perhaps there's a, uh, maybe there was a fracture here or something like that. And uh, you have two pins above, two pins below. Uh, this is called a ring fixator here. So in here you actually have uh, circular fixations, a ring here, ring here, sort of like rings and half rings around the foot. Um, different reasons for using this. Uh, this can actually use thin tensioned wires. Um, it has a lot of other uh, potential applications when you do a ring fixator. We won't get into too much of that. Um, coming back to this, the, uh, the portable traction, right? So sometimes you have a fracture in the knee or the ankle, let's just say as examples, uh, and the joint surface is compressed and um, you just want to get it out to length. And actually, this is where you're going to see X-Fix used a lot in trauma centers. Uh, you put some uh, pins down here in the tibia. Uh, you put some pins, uh, let's say for a knee fracture, you put some pins up here in the femur. And then you sort of, you know, you pull traction, right? And you distract this way and this way. And uh, you pull things, you know, the, the joint surface out to length. And it's like a portable traction, essentially, right? It's like pulling on the person's leg, except the person can move around with that. And in that case, it could be something temporary. But in some cases, external fixation is definitive. So um, it can be used for both. But most of the time, you see it used as temporary treatment. And what about intramedullary nailing? Well, these are rods, right, that go in the intramedullary canal. They're uh, indicated when it's OK to have only gross fracture alignment to restore function. Typically for diaphyseal fractures, mostly the tibia and femur, but some bones to the lesser extent, the humerus, uh, can be rotted as well. They even make rods for almost anything with a, which has a canal, uh, a forearm, you know, metacarpals, etc. But uh, most of the time they're used and they're successful in the femur and tibia. And they do require a patent medullary canal without pre-existing deformities. Uh, because these rods cannot be really shaped or anything. I mean, they they come in a commercially available, you know, sizes and widths and curves. And um, you know, if a patient has a little bit too much uh, uh, atypical morphology of their bone, the rod's not going to go in. You know, plates and screws you can sometimes bend and twist and get them to fit. And like I said, an X fix you can put on almost anything. But rods really, really uh, have to kind of they have a, they have a tight path to navigate. And arthroplasty, right? So arthroplasty is indicated for articular and periarticular fractures, right? So fractures of the joint surface and or, and right near the joint surface when repair is not possible, okay? And replacement is the only option to return to function. So uh, I give an example of a femoral neck fracture that's displaced in the elderly, right? Because the, the other thing is certain joint replacements you don't want to do in younger patients, the hip being one of them. Uh, another example is a comminuted radial head fracture. Not a weight-bearing uh, thing, so you will see, sometimes uh, see these done in younger patients if it's absolutely necessary and unfixable. Another example, head splitting proximal humerus fracture in the elderly. You could potentially treat with an arthroplasty or a joint replacement. You basically say, you know what, this is not going to come out well if we try to fix it. It's going to have a poor outcome. It might not heal. It might have osteonecrosis. We're just going to throw it in the trash, put in a joint replacement, and that's going to make this patient functional, not need more surgery. And because they're older, it's not going to wear out in a year or two, um, as opposed to you know, 20, 30-year-olds who try not to do joint replacements. So I'm going to stop there, and um, we'll pick up with some of the associated injuries and neurovascular exam compartment syndrome in the next set of slides. Thanks.